Well, welcome back to the How Soccer Explains Leadership podcast. Today, we're really excited to have Pete Kipley here in with us. Now, Pete is uh, a guy that has, you know, he's got quite the resume. It's, it's, it's not your, your typical soccer resume. I'm going to tell you that right now. But that's what we're going to hopefully have on this show. Pete is the founder of Bolt to Soccer, which he's going to talk about a little bit later. But he also spent many years in the music industry. He was a producer, songwriter, musician. He wrote some pretty cool songs, won some awards. You know, if you really want to find out more about him, you can look online. We're not going to get into all that today, mainly because Pete really didn't want to. But mm-hmm. what we're going to, what we're going to, we are going to talk about is really what Pete knows about the intersection between soccer, life, leadership, what he's learned in all those things. And so with that, Pete, you know, I'm, I'm really excited for you to be here. I don't know. I don't know if you're Thank excited you. as I am. I hope you are. I'm very excited. All right. Cool. Man, you have got such a good podcast voice. I'm well, intimidated you know, now. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, you know, it's just years of talking. That's all it <laughs> is. You. That's, you know, my wife would, would attest to that. So we'll, we'll, you know, nothing. I That's haven't practiced. Amazing. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens with that. Looking um, forward to this. So, you know, with that, with that, Pete, you know, we'll get in a little bit about where we met and that later, but what I want you to do right now is just share your story of how you got to be where you are today as the founder of Bolt to Soccer. Team. Yes training and all kinds of other cool stuff at this uh, soccer facility in the middle of Tennessee. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, Phil. I think it, my story started a lot. Like I think a lot of other parents of, uh, of kids who play, we've got, we have four kids, two, two of them play. And uh, one of them has all of his mom's DNA. He's absolutely gorgeous boy. And, <laughs> and, and I knew that I knew he, I knew he had some talent there in soccer, but kind of being in a different industry, maybe I didn't quite realize to what level he, he might find some potential in that sport and until at that time, somebody did come and watch him play and, and told us about an opportunity with a club here in Nashville that was just bringing ECNL in, into the area. And, and he felt like Miles could benefit from that which was exciting for him. So we did, we, he tried out for that team and uh, he made, he made that team. And it was, that was kind of just the beginning of the uh, eye opening experience there for me, mainly hearing, hearing coaches implore their players do a lot of the same things that I was imploring musicians or bands to do, which was just work outside of, of practice. You know, we've got to work on that first touch, first touch, first touch. And, I didn't know what first touch was. I knew a lot about <laughs> pocket with, right. with drums, those kind of things. But, but it was fascinating to me that the, just to the, the level of expectation that those coaches had for these players. And a lot of those coaches had come in from overseas and, and I think they were used to kids that were taking a lot more touches than, than maybe the kids were here. But it kind of uh, started that chapter of this life was just kind of trying to understand what they were saying and then seeing a need to, to facilitate that for some of those players. There just wasn't a, there wasn't a facility, a soccer specific training facility in Nashville at that time. And, and so I, that kind of started a, a, like a two year process of going to the conferences, talking to a lot of people, and then uh, eventually finding a, a space and, and starting off. And so you're really not doing much in the music side right now, is that right? It's true. It's funny because I think I, I, I do kind of miss it. I, I, did, I spent so many years doing, doing music um, and I always loved it. I, I think for me, it was, again, you know, when, when I'm looking in this world that I'm immersed in now and, and you see these coaches and these managers and, and the investment that they are making in those players, not just as players, but as humans. And you can see where they have taken that life leadership to a, another level it, it inspired me a lot because that's really what we, we were doing in the studio was, yes, we've got to make a great record. We've got to make great greater. But at the same time, here's somebody that's, that's on the road nine months of the year, a lot like a professional soccer player or college soccer player. Maybe, you know, they're, they're, they're with the same group of people 24 hours a day in a bus. And, and that was their time to come in and, and just kind of decompress and have an, an objective set of ears, listen to their stories. So it was, it was probably half psychology, to be frank with you, which I think really translates over into, into what we're doing now, especially in the day and age that we're in. 
with these young minds and, and kind of going through the year that we've gone through. Absolutely. We're going to mine a lot of that in the, in the next uh, few minutes on this interview. But I, I do want to say that, you know, we did meet at probably one of your biggest gigs that you ever played at a, at a family camp. You know, you were sitting up on stage playing bass, I believe. It was the bass that week with one of Slept our good friends. Yeah, you know, hey, you know, it was it was not quite a ska band, but you were you were rocking out back there. I'm not gonna lie, and you. you know, one of our good friends, Luke Brown, was was kind of leading the leading the band. I believe he invited you out, and you know, what really stuck out to me is you were wearing a Man City jersey up on stage. So I knew that I needed to kind of educate you on the finer things of of football. But I, right. I didn't let that Was stop it too me. tight, Phil? I felt like it might have well, been a little too tight. Well, I mean, tight. that's kind of the European way, isn't it? That's, that's the only way to wear a soccer jersey. Yeah, no, when you're 50. If you really yeah. want to be legit, you know. But, but I, I will say that, you know, it, somebody says, oh, you got to talk to Pete. He's a soccer guy, you know. And so we did. We talked. You were, I think you were out on the, on the field training with your son. He's a keeper. That automatically just, you know, that's my kindred spirit there. And, yes. and, you know, if I remember correctly, he at the time, he wasn't the tallest keeper. That's really my kindred spirit. And so, you know, I just, we just connected on that, right? And, and that, it's the, that, those conversations we had talking there, um, talking since then, that really did make me say, you know what, I got to get Pete on to talk with folks about this, this intersection that we talk about with that soccer mm -hmm. life leadership. And, and with that, I want to talk a little bit about your philosophy at, at Bolta, on your website, it says that you're, you know, curators, creators, and connectors. Can you, can you just talk about that a little bit, what you mean by those, what you're hoping anybody coming to your facility will, will come away with, and how Absolutely. others can hopefully learn from that? Yeah, thanks. That's a, good, that's a great question. You know, I think I'm going to start back with the very beginning of when we started Bolta, you know, I, I think in my mind, it was, is, is it the nicest turf? Is it the best balls? Is it the great machinery? Is it the satellite trackers? Is it all of the, the everything? And, and, and I kind of went down that path with, through a, a bit of naivety at the beginning, thinking that that would impress people and very, very quickly realized the human element in, in this. It's a ball, it's a few cones and a great trainer. You know, somebody that can invest in, 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 in not just that one session, but, but the many years that lead up to whatever it is you want to accomplish as, as a player. And, and to me, I realized that this is a good opportunity. I feel like soccer is growing very fast. We, we, we have a new MLS team in our town. Uh, first year, they're, they're doing amazing. Very proud of them. But, but as you well know, like, like soccer up until maybe this year where everything's kind of been put a little bit on pause has become such a, a viable sport option, particularly for girls here in the States, but for a lot of, a lot of guys too that you're seeing. And, and now I think we've got, what, 11, 11 U.S. men players that are playing on Champions League teams in Europe now. That's going to um, greatly improve our chances, not only at just getting in <laughs> this year to the World Cup, but, but, but doing well, having those players perform at, at those levels and then bring that back to, to the, this experience here. But, you know, and as I started just meeting more and more uh, kids, more and more parents, coaches, uh, players, you know, I realized that this is not a company that we're building. This is a culture that we're building. This is, and, and culture is, is so important, especially when you're melding the minds and how the mind and the heart and the body work with young players, you know, and, and to me, it was, I, I just had hoped to be able to find like-minded people. I don't actually do the training. I, I curate the trainers and I feel like in, in, in our neck of the woods, I, I couldn't be happier with, with the trainers that we have. I feel like they're the best, but, but it's just a good culture. And that we really experienced that during, during this pandemic where all of a sudden you've got to, you know, we've got to shut down hey, it's, it's mandated. So that means we had to shut down. And, and that's where we, we kind of started, I feel like our, the cloth and our fabric just began to get a lot stronger and, and, and finding people that, that see you know, themselves and the players that they train and don't just look at this as how can I get through 60 minutes as quick as I can, you know? 
So, so that's, that's what we're doing on the curation side. On the, on the creation side, what, what we're trying to do is create more opportunities for players, whether they're coming in from overseas or if they're coming in from, you know, regionally to, to be able to perform in front of, you know, whether it's coaches at, at, at USL clubs or MLS clubs or, or at colleges, trying to create opportunities. So instead of just having a, hey, we've got, you know, buy five, 60 minute, you know, sessions in a package. But what we're really trying to do is focus that programming into, hey, where do you fit and what we might be able to do for you in the future? So just kind of trying to create opportunities. And that's, that, that's the focus that I, that I kind of have there at Volta. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, and, and I, I was really just impressed with those, those three things and also talking about the connectors, which I think goes to something else you talked about earlier today in this conversation with the idea of, you know, how you, how you got in the music industry is very similar to how you're seeing the kids are getting into the soccer you know, yes. the not business, but the, the idea of college, the idea of pros, the idea of getting to the, you know, that next level, whatever it is, right? You have the next level of music, you have the next level of business, you have the next level of whatever it is, right? So what are those parallel things that you've seen as you learn that, that, you know, our kids can learn from, but also people that are coming out of college, people that are coming into the, into the real world, so to speak, you know what I mean? Hopefully y'all know what I mean by that. Obviously the soccer pitch is the real world, but to go <laughs> into right. the business world, right. You know, to be able to take this, what we're learning to that life, those life lessons. Yeah. I remember, you know, when, when I was dreaming about getting into the music industry as a producer, over over several years and and again the similarities are they're just uncanny you know you, you've got to do the work you've got to continue to get better at your craft whether that's your instrument or whether that's writing you know I, I believe it's songwriting you use a muscle to do that and you've got to keep that thing fit to be able to make sure that you're producing the best that you can on on average there but you know what really helped me at the beginning was finding mentors, finding people that saw something in me and, and, and decided to make an investment. And, and that's what got me to Nashville was a couple guys that were here that were doing it, that felt like there was some potential there for me. And, and, and I'll never forget these guys for the rest of my life. You know, that, so they were like coaches, mentors, friends. Same thing here and what we're doing with soccer is, is, you know, trying to identify those players that we feel like we can really assist in going to the next level. And, and a lot of that boils down to the philosophy that yes, we want, we want everybody to be engaged and love the sport. You've got to love it to want to stay in it. But you will see a few players that, that you can tell have got that potential to, to go to that next level. And I feel like especially now with, with COVID and, and you're looking at you know, the dead period for recruiting continually being extended and then these girls, maybe they're sophomore, junior, seniors, that are used to having a social high school soccer experience are kind of stuck at home with their moms mm -hmm. and maybe brothers and sisters, and they can't go out. It's, you know, I feel like a lot of these players are wondering, am I even going to go to college? You know, will there be college? It's a whole lot for a, for a, a young player to deal with from the mentality standpoint. So for me, and, and our crew are like, even tonight, it's the, it's the di district finals here in Franklin for the girls. And then we go to these games because the, I know they love to feel the support mm -hmm. and they love to see, Hey, you know, I just trained with Andrew Saturday and he's here to come and watch and, and, and kind of going that extra mile to, to just be sure that, that these kids mentally, emotionally, as well as physically are, uh, are able to perform at the levels they need to for right now. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, what I've tried to talk about with my kids is, you know, use these experiences that you have with the coaches as you're getting recruited, as you're having conversations, you know, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a, a visit, whatever it may be, this is what it's going to be like in the future. Use this to practice for your, your future interviews for, for jobs, right? You know, for, for, yes. for your to, to also know how to evaluate whether you want to work for someone 
as you're looking at schools, do you really want to play for this coach? And from yes. the coach's side, and really from that leadership side too, I think something you said really stuck out to me was, and I just think back to my different interviews when I was, you know, looking at coming out of law school, looking at lower, you know, law firms, or, you know, just talking to different people and doing the hiring side, that if, if, the, if the people aren't really talking about their culture, if they're not really talking about why you, you know, basically you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. And from that, from that other side of it, from that hiring side, right. From that yes. coach's side, the only coach that I, you know, the only coaches, there were a few coaches that I, and I'm not going to name any names at this point, but I will give you a hint that they're likely going to be on this show at some point that my daughter, Great. when she was being recruited, that I said, I would be okay with you playing for them. Each mm -hmm. one of them said, you're who you are as a person as, as important, if not more important than who you are as a player. Absolutely. And, yep. and they meant it. You could tell they meant it. They weren't just mm -hmm. saying it as part of the pitch, right? Because they had examples. And I think that's really important for us to remember too. And so I, I, what do you think about that? Have you seen that in the, in the conversations? I mean, I absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think you bring up a very, very, very helpful point, not only for parents that are walking their kids through that process, but but more importantly for those, for the kids themselves, you know, when you were saying, Hey, use this time to practice, you know, when, when you're in that, especially now, so now, you, you know, everything is almost like backlogged and, and jammed. I mean, uh, coaches haven't been able to come out to games, haven't been able to come out to showcases. They're really dependent on, on guys like us um, kind of helping them uh, navigate the talent pool regionally and sending video video, 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 but as these girls and, and, and boys too, but as you're, as you're talking to coaches, it, it, it's, I think it's very nerve wracking that first telephone call because you don't really know what to say and you're nervous and, and maybe you don't know the, the right questions to ask, you know, but then, then maybe the next call goes a little better and then maybe you text the coach and, and, you, and you get to have the communication again. And I think it's understanding that, hey, this is just as much a part of my training as actually training, is mm -hmm. learning how to have a conversation, how to speak with an adult, and then understanding those bullet points of, of, of what it is that, that you're looking for and, and navigating. The number one thing you've got to do when you're looking at a school is make sure that that school is going to be the best for the rest of your life. Right. Not just that you'll get a starting spot, you know, your freshman year, and then, wait a minute, you know, I, I want to be a doctor. Why am I going to the, you know, I don't know, the auto mechanic school or I want to be an engineer. Why am I going to the medical school? You know, finding out those, those schools, narrowing them down into what you want to ultimately become. Because even if you make it to the next level of soccer beyond college, there's still a gigantic piece of life right. waiting for you at the end. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll want to, you know, work into coaching or something, but, but odds are there's something else inside of you that needs to come out as well. You yeah. know, so I think, I think finding that school and then you're right. Uh, it has to boil down to culture. And, and sometimes I think that you'll get a sales pitch from a coach sure. and it's going to be this way, this way. And then you go, it's, well, I wasn't that way, but, but understanding that, Hey, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing, I'm, be, I'm becoming a part of a team uh, and a team has, is more than just me. I've got to be sure that I can relate with the coaches and then, and, and yeah, I, I think narrowing those things down is going to be extremely helpful. Absolutely. And, I, and this is, this is kind of a side note, but I will remember when, when I was one of the best pieces of advice I ever received when it came to choosing like a job, or even when I was looking at law schools, the people said interview, not officially, but interview the administration and talk with them about their experience. Because you know what? They know everybody as well as anybody. So like the receptionist, for instance. Talk to the receptionist. They know the culture. And they'll talk because you're out in the lobby for 10, 15 minutes, right? So when you're going to interviews, when you're going on recruiting visits, when you're going, don't just focus on the, the players and the coaches, which are important. But talk to other people who are around the, and say, is this legit? Like, is this real? Yes. And they'll know. And they'll like tell. And you'll be able to tell. Right. And so those are things that I think are just important for life to be able to understand what that looks like. And, and, you know, I can tell you watching my 
daughter on those calls that I, I just had these flashbacks. There's a little PTSD. I'm not going to lie because it was painful <laughs> watching her on some of those initial calls, but you know what? Sure. She did get better. Now she's still not super comfortable because it's partly personality as well. Certain personalities mm -hmm. will have no problem. They'll just go do it. No, no big deal. Other ones are going to struggle more with it. And, but she got a lot better, more comfortable because she realized, you know what, if it's a good call or a bad call, you hang up and life goes on. And that's just the same for anything that you're doing, right? We put all that's this right. pressure on ourselves. And at the end of the day, it's like, wait a sec, that wasn't that big of a deal. So the other thing I just, it was interesting to me is when you're talking about the, the curation and the curating coaches, it just made me laugh that you're just a producer in a different arena, right? Like Maybe. that's basically what you're doing. I mean, very similar, right? You're very kind similar. Of, it's, you know, just kind of bringing that band yeah. together and yeah. You're just bringing the talent, the best people, and you know what you're best at and what you're not best at. And I think that's a big part of leadership as well, right? Like, you know what you're, what you're good at, what your areas is, but you want to bring in people better than you and the things that are really important. And so yes. hopefully. All right. So let's move on to one of the other things we wanted to talk about. Really just, you know, I want to hear what you're learning and what you're seeing about the game. Because as you said, you're not this lifelong soccer dude. It's not like you, you know, grew up like I did in age four to pretty much 46, just being a part of the game and it being a part of me, right? You're kind of coming in with your kids from the outside, learning about it. And there's such a value to hear that, what you're learning, what you're seeing. And I just want to hear from you what you're learning about the game, what you're learning about all of this, as, particularly as it relates to the mental side of the game. You know, what, what have you been seeing? And wow, learning? gosh, you, you kind of closed that with the, with the highlight. You know, I, I will back up, and I, I really want to spend a lot of time talking, talking about that piece because I, I think, you know, as you're looking at it, breaking down a player, and, and again, you know, it's, it's not rocket science. We're, we're not going to be working with a nine or 10 year old the same way we're going to be working with a 21 year old pro or, or a 15 or 16 year old with, with lots of potential to do one of the other, you know, but you're focusing on technique, 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 you know, first touch, first touch for sure. And, and, and then, yeah, let's, let's work. The, the thing that I love so much about the trainers that we have is they come at it, that they are, have been able to marry that technique and that tactical piece better than I, I've ever seen. Because really when you, when you have a coach and you're playing at a high level, you, you're kind of expected to have the technique, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've got somebody that's responsible for speed and agility for your fitness. And then, and then a coach kind of needs to be focusing on tactics. Yep. on, okay, what are the combinations that work? What are the packages I can send out? What do I do in this situation? Who's the next team I'm playing? That's where their, their focus has got to be there as opposed to, wow, we've got to send this kid off to get a better, you need to kind of have the, the first touch there. But, you know, working on mentality what was definitely, I think, maybe number four in those pillars. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if, you, if you have technique, you know, tactical, fitness, speed, and agility, and then mentality, and maybe four was way over here, to the right, that was a long number four. Now it's just a completely solid number one mm -hmm. because you're just dealing with so many more issues than we were dealing with last year or, or players that were, you know, I think anytime you have a global pandemic, it's going gonna, it's gonna to flip a lot of things around. But I mean, it was just in, uh, incredibly uh, upsetting and, and challenging to, to, to see players kind of coming in with, with long faces. Because, wow, I'm, I'm sure that the tryout process was the same in California as it was here. It was no contact. Mm -hmm. So if you're a defender, you're not really going to be able to show your best qualities if they're running one drill that, that makes a striker and a, and a keeper look good. Right. You know, yep. and, and boy, I sure hope my, my center back can put in a good cross. Well, they're kind of used to defending crosses more than putting them in. Right. So if they make them, you know, just a lot of those kind of, of pressures, but you know, my main concern isn't what's happening with them today or tomorrow or this week. It's kind of what's going to be happening with them in three years, five years, based on what what these kids have have gone through, and and you add to that the pressures that maybe some parents uh, will put on those kids, which is something I really feel like we need to talk about. And, and, and on top of the pressures that they have for themselves and, and trying to reacclimate to society because they you know, can't really go to football games, can't really go to a prom, 
you know, it's like, okay, we've got to work in these small groups. So kind of really focusing on, on, on making sure that we're communicating with like, how are you? We're building that trust, you know? And I think, I think for us, we've done a, a, a good job of, of having guys and girls that are just unbelievable trainers. Because I think, I think a lot of times it's good for, to have somebody that, wow, you're, you're playing pro right now. I want to play pro. Um, having them say, Hey, how are you doing? Like, really, how are things at home? How are things with, with your teammates or your friends? And just kind of breaking it down to uh, the bare bones of communication with these kids and making sure that we're looking out for them mentally yep. as the priority. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, I think that's so huge for, for parents to hear, for coaches to hear, for, I think also business leaders to hear, for, you know, teachers to hear, for people who are impacting anybody that's under you. I think as a leader, you need to hear that very clearly that you need to, I think it also is important to study the individual as well and to know how they react to different stimulation, to different encouragement, to different things that are part of what they are, you know, talking about here. So I think that that is, those are all critical, critical aspects of, of just, I think life is to, to know who you're talking to, to know what that impact of your words and your actions and your tone will have on them. And so with that, I think what you talked about and something that, you know, we don't really need to, to go into a lot of detail and give a lot of examples of it. Cause I think anybody who's been around youth sports at all has seen parents that are micromanaging parents that are pressuring. And sometimes it's, it's healthy and sometimes it's really unhealthy. And so as far as I say, pressuring and micromanaging, I, I don't know many times that's healthy, but there are times where the encouragement and certain kids will be, will be encouraged and inspired in different ways than others. So to, to look at one and say that's wrong may not be having the whole story. But with that, what have you seen with that? What are your, you know, and, and I would say kind of bring in your experiences in the music industry as well to talk about really how have you seen that impact the, the players, the musicians, whatever, and what would you encourage people to, to do to hopefully make that so it's not really as much of an issue in the future? Yeah, I think, I think you just, that's where the rubber meets the road right there is that, is that parent-athlete relationship. And, and I'm happy that I get to speak from, from both sides of that coin. You know, a, a lot of our trainers are, you know, the, the late twenties, they don't have kids yet. So, so they don't quite understand what, you know, but they definitely had parents. And, and it was funny because even, even the trainers that we have, uh, a half of them had the right kind of soccer parent and the, the other half had kind of an aggressive soccer parent. But, you know, for me, I think I made a whole lot of mistakes at the very beginning. You know, fortunately nothing, I'm, I'm a positive person to start with. I, I definitely have, have such a hard time hearing parents that, that are, you know, putting that added pressure on their kids as opposed to keeping things, you know, positive. And, and number one, just learning to trust the process, you know, in youth soccer, it's almost every club says, Hey, parents, you know, trust the process, you know, for, for sure. You'll see the, those kids that, you know, maybe they, you know, put a ball in, maybe they miss the shot and, 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 instead of you're going to miss shots, you take shots, you miss shots. And, and if you, if you watch a, you know, a high level professional take a shot and miss, usually the look on their face is a smile. <laughs> it's like, okay, we yeah. all know I should have made that. I know I should have made it. The coach knows it. The right. teammates know it. Okay. I'll, I'll make the next one. When a lot of times what we see are kids that when they miss that shot, the first thing they do is immediately turn to, to the, where the parents are. And, and see if their mom and dad saw it. They don't look at the coach or the team. That's the first thing that they do because they know it's going to be a long ride home, you know, maybe for just missing a shot. You know, I think there's such a fine line in, in parenting and being a fan. And then, you know, as a parent, you know, creating opportunity, maybe encouragement to, hey, you know, if this is something you want to do, I'd recommend to go work with this guy or work with this girl, or maybe we should look to, you know, go to this club, but kind of that's where it needs to end right there in that relationship. Because what happens with the kids is all of a sudden they're feeling like their worth to a parent is based on a performance on a field. 
mm. which is just planting the wrong seed instantly. The, the, their worth has nothing to do with miles. But if he misses an easy save, we've, we forgot about it the next week, you know, for sure. But, but it, that cannot be what he feels like secures his value with me as a dad, you know? Right. And for us, and I, I have a feeling you were the same way. We don't talk about soccer ever, ever, unless he brings it up, you know, like sometimes there, there'll be a, a, a bad game, whatever, maybe 10 minutes, you know, down the road, he'll say, I, I can't believe this, you know, which I love. I love it when he talks about it with me, yeah. but, but there's no way that he could take it. If, if I was like, Hey, what happened there in the, in the 15th minute, that's, that's an easy save for you. You see, he already knows it. He's right. already beat up about it. What he needs to hear me say is, Hey, I'm proud of you, you know? And, and I, I do hope for him and, and really for, for everybody, you know, I hope they're giving their best effort, but, but they're going to make mistakes just like we do, you know, and that's, and you learn from the mistakes and try to create that opportunity. But we have one girl in particular whose, whose mom is just a little too much. And, and it was, you know, it scared me to the point where, you know, she's texting the coach, really not supposed to be, you know, communicating with the coach. The coach needs to communicate with the player. Mm -hmm. But when she would come in even to watch the, the training sessions, I'd notice that the, the, the player's level would drop probably 50%. That's like, hmm, this is very interesting. And she's at such a high level here. But then when, when this shows up, drops down and, I think for me, you know, my encouragement, I, I love giving, giving talks to clubs and especially on behalf of parents and saying, hey, you know, you really do need to trust the process. Not every club is perfect. Not every team is or coach is great. You've got, you know, that's great, not so great. But, but you've at least got to trust the process that they know what they're doing. Hey, just encourage your kid. It's not rocket yeah. science. No, absolutely. And I think there's so much there that, you know, that could be like, half a season, I think, of, of episodes mm -hmm. on what you just talked about there. But I, I think one of the things I, I really kind of draw out of that is that idea of, of a freedom to fail, right? And, you know, to be able to know that. And I think that goes from the, from the, the soccer field to life, right? I think that goes to, yes. as a parent, you know, they need to understand that you love them. Their identity is not in soccer. It's not in grades. It's not in anything. It's in, they are your child. They are, you know, in my, in my worldview and yours, it's, they're a child of God. You know, that's their identity. And they, they can play. If they're loving playing, keep playing. If you, if you can make it to that next level, as you said, you know, if they ask you for that advice and you know the advice, you know, like for me, my kids ask me more because they know that I'm a coach. They know that I know these different things. So they do ask me and I will give them because I ask them, Are you, do you want the, you know, you want the coach or you want the dad? And depending on the moment, they'll say different things. Ultimately, it's the dad always. Hmm. But after a game, you know, I help coach, you know, I'm the assistant on my, uh, I was on my daughter's team, never the head coach of her, but for good reason, we'll get, we can get into that later. But when she asked, we talked about it. And she knew that when she did, had a phenomenal game, I talked to her about that. And we told her when she didn't, we talked about the things that she already knew she could have done better, but I didn't bring it up in those different ways. Because as you said, here's the thing. It was my wife and I, my wife played D1 soccer. I went to school to play. We, we have that in our part of our family, right? And and so we have this saying in our house that when you shank a shot, you don't need everyone to tell you you shank the shot, right? You know you shank the shot, right? And so, and that's basically that's what right. you just said, right? And Wayne Rooney hit it up in the upper deck. I've seen him, him take a shot and it go out of bounds. It was so far to the right. And, you know, those are the realities of life too, is you have those moments where you do shank the shot. And if you have everyone piling on you about how you shank that shot, whether in whatever area of life, it's not helping. In fact, it makes your performance suffer in the future. And so I just want to hear on that idea, that concept, really how you saw that, how, how you saw that come out in, in your time in the music industry. Did you see that same thing with the musicians or a similar thing? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's funny because in, in that world, shoot, you, you can have a hundred chances and nobody sees it. No, no, nobody hears the flat. No, nobody knows when, when you missed the fill or, or you didn't read your chart right because you just hit stop, 
rewind, record, right. and you just get it till it's right. And obviously that's not the way it works in sports, you know, right. as much as we wish it would. Oh, wait, we can't take a mulligan because I missed the shot or I put in a, a bad cross or I, I, I should have parried that goal over instead of putting it right back in. So there, there is a little bit more pressure there, I think, on where it relates to the athlete because, you know, I, I feel like, shoot, musicians, imagine this. Imagine if you're really kind of playing the same team, you know, 60, 90 times a year yeah. um, th with the exact same lineup. The same, you kind of just get it down and, and boom, you know, you're in. Not, not really suffering on the, I guess some, some bands can have bad nights, but, but it's, it's much easier to fly by, I think, in that, in that music realm where, you know, as technology changed, it's interesting. What I feel like one thing that's opposite and not, not for everybody, but, you know, as technology changed and it became so much easier to fix issues, you know, through a computer than having to just get it right the first time, th that became a little bit frustrating because, you know, you do want, even, even at Bolta, you know, I, I want that product to be at a 10 every time every session you know so hey listen if, if 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 you're on to your third session as a trainer and wow you don't feel like you can bring that full hour value or 90 depending on what it is you just gotta let me know and then we'll bring this other trainer over it's okay to say hey i'm not gonna be you know at my 10 but that's another piece of the pressure for the players you know i feel like they they feel like they've got to be at its 10 and you know good for them when they are for us especially in, you know in our training philosophy we we want you to make mistakes make the mistake make the mistake but we also want you to be engaged and quick to learn to understand that that's the mistake and then okay this is how i begin to correct it so if we're working on somebody getting a left foot that we're not going to be able to fix that in 15 minutes you know that's going to take a long time but if it's those tiny mistakes whether it's your positioning or, or, you know, your touch, especially being able to understand, Hey, I blew it. Bad touch. Okay. That's right. You've got to fix it, clean it up. And that's another thing too, is, you know, we really work, we love working in groups as opposed to individuals, mainly because it's not an individual sport. You know, you're playing with other people and the sessions are able to move faster and, and have more energy. But sometimes somebody you're training with is going to give you a bad ball and then you don't have your touch, you don't make your shot and the trainer's chewing you out and they're complaining, Hey, he didn't give me, she didn't give me a good ball. Well, <laughs> that is so much like life, isn't it? Yep. How many times do we get teed up with a good ball in life? <laughs> but it's that thing. It's, it's understanding. Yeah. Okay. How do I respond to a bad ball? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to have to learn how to, how to fix that. And, and then not say anything because odds are you're going to give a bad ball to somebody the next play. Absolutely. That's funny you say that, man. Like I, I remember back when I was teaching a course at university and I, I assigned group projects and never fail. Every time I assigned a group project, I'd get people complaining left and right about it because they knew they were going to be the one ending up doing everything. Hmm. Right. And what I told them though, during that, I said, here's the deal. This is life. So at, this is how life works. If you're, the vast majority of your jobs are going to be group projects at some point. That's right. And there will be times where you get handed, as you said, garbage, right? Like that's the part that, you know, the three other people. And I've seen my kids do group projects. I've seen other people do projects. I've done group projects and it happens virtually every time. And my daughter's like, dad, every time I'm always doing. I said, you know what? Do it with everything you got because you know what at the end of the day your teacher doesn't care who did what but if you want a good grade <laughs> that's right. you got to do it right and so in soccer when that bad ball comes you better make the most of that bad ball when i was a lawyer i'd get stuff put on my desk that was terrible writing just awful i'm going how do these people pass law school like i have no idea but when i gave it to the next partner who was in line he didn't care what came on my desk he cared what i put on his desk and those are the realities of, right. of life, right, that come up that, you know, and I think as a leader, though, as the teacher, I did say, though, with your team, if you guys at the end of it, I'll give you the opportunity to evaluate your team. And then I will take that into account. And honestly, the only thing I ever saw, which actually encouraged me was people saying, 
so-and-so did more work. I never saw someone throwing someone else under the bus. And when I, and I knew who was doing what. And so at the end of the day, I'd give that next, that person who I knew did everything, but they didn't throw them under the bus. I gave them an extra few points. Nice. Like as you would in an organization, if you saw that as a leader, you could do that. But if you see people throwing people under the bus, I'd have a conversation with them and say, Hey, look, that's not teamwork. Right. And at the end of the day, like I get what you're doing. I get that you're bitter, but when you're on a team, it's your team performance that's going to do it. And so, you know, if you can talk to other people. Anyway, those are things that I saw. So any thoughts on that? That, that was a lot there. I that's what makes me it. smile, you know, especially in, in a game setting when, when you're familiar with a player and you know what their abilities are. When, when, when you see them handle a situation, especially when we're talking about putting balls in, it's going to happen. They're going to miss you. But finding those players that, that are able to quickly adjust, it's going to be so helpful, I think, in life. Yep. You know, I, I think, I think for us, it, it's any given day, you know, the life of an adult, when you've got kids and you've got your wife and business and not everything's going to go perfect, but finding that way to say, okay, I've just got to, I got to fix this and then, and then push through. And, and like you said, do the be- very best that you can with it. But I feel like that's so much, I mean, a part of, of becoming a player and understanding, especially as you're growing and, and proceeding, it's, it's, you know, coaches will always tell you it's about finding that space, creating that space, you know, coming into support and, and, and it all works hand in hand. If you see somebody that's given you a, a, a ball, maybe they've been under pressure that it helps you understand, okay, I'm going to help this guy out. I'm going to take a good touch and, and move through. But I think finding, oh, man, again, you know, the parallels, they, they are so funny with, with soccer and life, you know, like finding that, that way to, yeah, okay, I'm, I need to. I need to cover up for this guy. I need to help my wife out with this. That's right. but a lot of times we need the help too. That's right. and it's just kind of nice to know that, wow, I got my back. That's awesome. Exactly. That's when you see the, the well-oiled machine teams out there who are playing together. And it's like clockwork. If someone gets out of position, someone's covering them. And the teams that get burned are the ones that people think they're too important or they're, they're this or they're that and you get the prima donnas and they're not going to cover for someone. And then the whole, you know, it's a weak link sport. You're going to be as, as strong as your weakest link. And, and so those are all things that, you know, we'll talk more and more about on this show and, you know, I'll have to get you back on. we got a, we got a lot more we can talk about, but we are coming towards the, the end of our time together. But I do want to talk about a couple more things. You know, one of the thing is the, you know, the idea of just what are the, what are some of the qualities, you know, we've talked about some of the coaches, some of the trainers that you have, but what are some of the qualities of the best coaches that have come through your clinic or who you have, you know, seen coach your kids that you've just, you know, experienced, what are some of those qualities that are kind of the common threads amongst those coaches? And that is, that is a great question. You know, I I feel like, I, I think you can even see it in coaches that you don't know personally, like for instance, let's take Jurgen Klopp. Okay, for some reason, there's, he has found this way to lead kids that are a little bit more difficult to lead than we were, maybe. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like absolutely. some of the, the millennial kids and, and the way that they communicate, you'll see other coaches that, that just kind of, they, they, they fall out. It's because they, they're not able to adapt to the way we've got to learn how these kids communicate. Yeah. Because we can, otherwise, it, it literally sounds like we're speaking in a different language. But, but that's okay. That's just the way that, that life works. But, you know, you're looking at these, at these kids now, and I think you bring up a, a great point by what you said there in that last segment. You know, we really work hard on perception, both as trainers and as players. And, and I want to touch on that, you know, as it relates to uh, the, the qualities that I like to see in coaches and, and trainers. But but even as it relates to the player in, in situations like tryouts or, or, or ID camps, you know, the, a coach is going to notice how you react to the outcome of the situation. And if they, if they see you just pounding the pitch or screaming or ripping your head off, they're not really going to want to bring that player <laughs> to their, to their team. Yeah. It's like that, that reaction. And, and okay. Yeah. You'll notice if, if you're working with a, a seven-year-old team, if, if they lose, what do they do? They all just start crying and, until they get their juice box and their little fruity fruits and then right. everything's fine again. But, but helping people to understand how to 
take control of their reactions and take control of those emotions. And you know what? It, it, it's funny if, if you watch, you know, any of the top players, you know, come out on a Sunday morning or Champions League game, whatever it is. The thing I notice is a, a lot of them have the same expression on their face when they walk onto the pitch as they do when they walk off. It's the same expression, whether they won or whether they lost, you know, it's, hey, they had a job to do. They, uh, they understand that this is a responsibility. And by working yourself up emotionally, it's not going to uh, really impress anybody. <laughs> you know? yeah. I feel that for these kids too. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe more especially for the kids, you, you know, uh, trying to come to that, to that balance of, of the pressure that they're putting on themselves, um, the pressure that they're feeling from their teammates and their coaches. And then, and then that trying to balance that pressure that they're feeling from the parents, you know, yeah. which you know, again, it, it's always going to come back to, to that. And I don't know if, if, if you notice this, but uh, y- your kid will never listen to you. That's just a rule. That's the way it is. Once they hit about 12, I think once they hit 12, <laughs> it's exactly. Over, right. If you tell them, Hey, listen, I feel like maybe you should be up off the balls of your feet. It's no, no, you don't know what you're talking about. And then the very next day, the coach says, hey, I need you up off the ball to your feet. They're like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's right. So I feel like the quicker that we can come to that realization as parents, the better. You know, I, I feel like like with with the trainers, when you're looking for those qualities, you know, it, 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 this isn't a, a fast food industry. These are kids that, OK, wow. You know, we, we love it when we, we see that, you know, young players that are you can't even tell what foot they are because they're just executing both sides. So, so freely. And and those kids are are the easiest ones, but I I feel like, I feel like looking at that, taking that kid into account as to, okay, where's this kid come from and where does this kid want, want to ultimately go and finding that way to build that trust a lot of times, you know, on, on first sessions, kids will be scared to come because they're afraid that they're going to get yelled at or I did this wrong. But, but finding those ways to present yourself as, as somebody that can be trusted as an adult, because that's what we are. We're adults if we're coaches, if we're trainers. That's right. You know, the, the, the coaches that, to me, it's, yeah, it's a fine line. And you're going to see, uh, you know, watch any of the, the shows and you see the, the coaches screaming their heads off in the locker room. You know, it's kind of a little bit of a part of the job, but it's like anything else. Um, it's that balance of realizing, wait a minute, it, it, am I going to be that coach that looks at a player as a commodity, as just somebody to help me get through a season? Or, or am I going to look at this player as somebody that I could have in my life for the rest of my life? And I don't think every relationship works out that way, but so many, so many of the great players and every one of our trainers has a story of that one coach, yeah. you know, that one coach that for some of them, maybe it was younger. Some of them, maybe it was college. We're very, very fortunate in Nashville. Uh, to, I feel like the college coaches here, particularly on the girls side are just off the chart and you know, they, they get it. They get the full experience. And you'll hear this from all the girls. It's like, yeah, I, I'd love playing for him or I love playing for her because I know that they're more invested in me as a human and as somebody that can have an impact on, on this world more than as a player that can only have an impact on a game that we're all going to forget about in two, two weeks, two months. Yep. I love that. I, I love the idea about, and whether it goes to parents talking to coaches and having them communicate a message, whether it's coaches understanding that they may not be the best person to connect with a particular player as well. We just had Paul Jobson on head coach Baylor Tim. soccer. He's awesome. I'm very fortunate to have gotten Paul on, but, but we, we talked about it on there too. The idea that there's some players that, that he doesn't connect as well with as some of his assistants and, you know, in, in law firms, you know, in businesses, in organizations, whatever it is, there may be some people that connect better with others. And for you as a leader to know that, to be able to say, Hey, here's the message we want to get across to them. Can you connect with them and make sure that they understand that whatever it may be. So I think that that goes at really every level and that goes to relationships as well, that there's certain things that, you know, will be communicated better by one 
more than another. So, you know, with that, that's something that actually kind of leads in the next question I want to, I want to say. This is kind of, this is definitely, a lot of these questions have been off script, which is typically what we're doing on this show. Just it. a heads up, folks out there. And you may, you may not, I don't know. But I'm assuming you do, given how much you've been thinking about soccer. But are there things that, you know, maybe one or two things that in your house, you use the principles of soccer to help you to parent, help you in your marriage, help you, you know, you know, that you could help others with out there? Absolutely. That, that's a, that's a great question. A great analogy too. You know, I think obviously we can, we can kind of touch on uh, what we already talked about with, with sure. just, Hey, you know, I'm just going to handle the bad ball. My seven year old screaming about the wrong flavor popsicle. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to let that one go this time. I'm going <laughs> to just take that and, you know, and, and respond this way. You know, to me, I think I, I lived such a create your own rules kind of life you know, out there in the music business for sure. And, and in some ways it's, it's still similar now, but, but what, what I love about soccer is the law and the rules of the game and the respect for it. And when a ball completely crosses the line, that ball is out and that, and that's it. It's not, mm -hmm. Oh, maybe it stayed in or like, like so much of life can be where, where it's easier to bend those rules and, you know, I, I love the order of, of soccer. I love the order and, and just the, the philosophies, the methodologies, right? you know, as you're, as you're progressing through the sport. That, that's helped me just a whole lot as a, a dad, uh, as a husband, hopefully, um, realizing, wait, that I just need to put more order here. These are the hours that I'm going to be here with the family or, or wow, that garage is kind of looking a little bit messy. That would never, ever fly with Jurgen Klopp. <laughs> I promise you, he wants your locker clean. That's right. So I, I feel like, you know, and, and to me, the, the beauty of it, it, so our facility, <laughs> our facility is one of two facilities right where the, the two major interstates meet in Nashville. So it's beautiful skyline, but the facility across from us is the Adventure Science Center, which is, you know, where you go and you learn yeah. about stars and it's really it's world-class here, here in town, but you know, it's so interesting to me how, how similar a, a ball flying through the air is exactly like life because you could have the same ball being kicked onto a different pitch and it's going to bounce the complete different way. You know, it's learning to adapt to this, this spinning, just a beautiful object that, is going to be a blessing or a curse, depending on what net it goes into, you know? I don't know, I, I, love, I, I love the beauty of, of this sport and, and I don't know, I, it's hard for me to find people that aren't beautiful people like you that, that don't love soccer, you know? It's, it's, maybe it's that whole kind of outlook online. We went a lot more philosophical on that one than I expected to, I'm not gonna lie. That was fantastic. <laughs> That was, we went science center. We went like, you're, you're like waxing right there. You're waxing philosophy going on. That was sweet. That was, no, that's great. I love it. I love it. And that's what you can tell is that, you know, they call it the beautiful game for a reason. I think it's part of it on the field. Yes. But I think also just how it impacts people and how it really is a way that you can communicate with people all around the world, which is part of the reason we're doing this show is to be able to help you to communicate it with your kids, communicate it with others and communicate it with anybody that you're dealing with. So last question. Question. You know, we're, uh, I, I just want to hear from you if you have any books or movies or podcasts, other resources that, that have really impacted your thinking on, on what we're talking about on the show, how soccer, leadership, or both can help us to flourish. Man, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, I, I definitely got maybe a little over immersed in the whole watching every single soccer game and every, every single show about it. I love watching those behind the scenes shows yeah. that, that are on Prime you know, starting with City and then Tottenham. I'm, I'm not sure how ultimately realistic those interactions yeah. are, but, but still, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun to be able to see that, again, you know, tie that human element in. And if you're looking for something to watch about soccer, just get on Prime. The, the last two seasons with the Leeds United story, yeah. who, that, I mean, that team is, is just fantastic. But I think even learning the lessons from, from they're so fortunate with the coach they were able to bring in. Mm -hmm. And then even through disappointment of, you know, not being promoted in that first year, 
the fact that he stayed, I will forever be a giant fan. Yeah, I absolutely. will. I will cry when when he moves on to the next to the next soccer life, wherever that is, because th that's the measure of a man. And you know, every one of those players said, "We're bringing this." That's right. We're bringing this next year, and and it's just it's a lot of fun to to see them experiencing, even through COVID. You know, yeah, what what they're experiencing, but they're a really I'd easy say, team to like. They're a really easy team to like and to be a fan of. A good friend of mine, hopefully he'll be on the show here in the future. A big Leeds fan. He lives in Leeds. So I've been, you know, don't tell anybody. There's, you know, going to be other than all the people who are listening. But, you know, as a United fan, I'm not supposed to like Leeds. <laughs> but as you said, it's hard not to like them right now, given what they've been through. Now, when they'll play United, I'm not going not gonna to be a big fan. However, sure. every other game, I'm like, man, these guys, not only are they fun to watch, but like you said, watching that on, on, on Prime, but also following it with my buddy it's just been a lot of fun to to follow them and their story and i think a lot of these lessons we're talking about you can learn from those things one show exactly. have you have you watched it reminded me of it when you talked about finding the right person to communicate a particular message have you been watching the ted lasso uh show at all <laughs> you gotta watch it if you haven't watched oh it I, I you know the first two episodes i'm like well, what's going on here you know i, I wasn't <laughs> sure but then after that it was it, was, it, it is amazing. Guys, if you haven't watched the Ted Lasso show, watch it. It's on Apple TV immediately. It's fantastic. I will say, just as a disclaimer, there, there is language. It's a British, you know, it's got a lot of British stuff, you know, going on. So there's, you know, a lot of F-bombs, a lot of language. So younger kids, probably not for them. But, but even some of the older kids, depending on, on that, I just want to make sure you understand that. However, there was a, a scene, I'm not going to ruin it, not a big spoiler, but there's this Nate who's the, the equipment guy, right? And a big, tons of leadership lessons. I think we're going to do an entire episode on the leadership lessons of Ted Lasso. I'll have to get you back on it for that one. But one of the things he brings in Nate, this equipment guy, to give the locker room talk and... I'm just going to tell you it was fantastic. That's all you need to know. And, but he knew that was the guy who needed to give that message on that day, and it was awesome. So with that, Pete, any last thoughts that you just want to give words of wisdom? I don't know how it's going to beat the Science Center and the floating no, ball that's never. spinning yeah. with everything philosophically. Oh, I don't know. Um, but I will just say, hey, you know, if you got something, go for it. If not, I just want to thank you uh, for well, being a part yeah. of this. No, no, this means so much. I love talking about this and, and, and I hope if you're, I would just say if, if you're a parent that came across this, I hope, hope it meant something to you and, and feel free to find a way to reach out and go to the website. I'd love to talk to you about the lessons that I've learned about being a soccer parent and, and the lessons that I'm learning still. It's, it's an ongoing process, but, but man, I'm really proud of you, Phil. It's, this is awesome and, and what you're doing and you're a great example and leader as well. So I appreciate you letting me be on your show. Well, thank you, Pete. I, I, I look forward to getting this out and having everyone learn from, from you. And, and what is, is it? Boltasports.com. Is that right? Bolt, yeah. Or boltasoccer.com. Okay. Yeah. And if you're ever in the area, please stop by. Would love, would love to meet you. It's down um, south, of, south of Nashville and Cool Springs. Um, well, it was, it was. Oh, it was. Now we are, we're dead center downtown oh, Nashville. Okay. That's new information for me. I'm glad I said something about it right in Nashville. So that's fantastic. Look them up. <laughs> Look them right. up. And also with this show, as you, as you know, you can find it on Apple podcast, Spotify. You can, you can also check it out at how soccer explains leadership.com, share it with others. And you can also, I encourage you, if you want to go deeper on these conversations, join the, the Facebook group. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram. We'd love to further deepen the conversation there, share anything that you have, any questions, any articles, any other things that you will know will help us to know how soccer does explain leadership and life and can help us to be better people. And I do hope that you take all that you're learning with this and you use it to help you to understand how you can use soccer to be a better person, to be a better leader and to flourish in life. Thanks a lot. Have a great week.